Free speech has always been central to the mission of a university. An academic's job is to consider new, even unpopular ideas and challenge the old ones. But what happens when they uncover what appears to be wrongdoing in the halls of their own institution? For professors who've made the difficult decision to blow the whistle, following their conscience can come at a price. My name is Philip Beverly. I'm an associate professor of political science at Chicago State University. I have been at Chicago State for 24 years. I teach courses in American politics, processes and institutions and public policy. Philip Beverly is the Chicago State professor who founded a faculty blog. The primary reason for starting the CSU Faculty Voice blog was to have an outlet, one, for faculty to be able to, to speak, and two, to be sort of a watchdog of the, the university. It's important to be able to, to say to people in a hierarchy, you're not doing it the way that it needs to be done. But Beverly says the blog's attempts to expose areas where CSU could improve soon made it a target for censorship by the administration. The administration uh, contacted us officially about the CSU Faculty Voice blog uh, early November of 2013. The general counsel and the president uh, of the university raised some questions slash objection to the blog based on some notion about it being uncivil because the, there had been some embarrassing posts about um, some hiring practices, shall we say. An affair was alleged to have occurred between President Watson and an employee of Chicago State. CSU's former chief financial officer, Glenn Meeks, alleged in a whistleblower lawsuit that President Watson fired him for reporting the affair. That employee, he claims, was promoted to a position for which she was not qualified because of her relationship with Watson. This allegation was among several issues Meeks sought to resolve, including pay bumps to administrative salaries and rising legal expenses for the school. Despite CSU's own whistleblower protection policy, Meeks was fired without cause. As these accusations came to light, the CSU faculty voice, led by Professor Beverly, was there, providing an unfiltered forum for professors. When I resisted any of their demands to be more civil or to uh, alter what the blog was doing, I thought that was the end of it until the following Monday when I had a letter um, delivered to my house by messenger that was a cease and desist letter telling me to shut the CSU faculty voice blog down. I called um, one of my co-contributors to the blog, Bob Bionis, a uh, professor in the history department, and said, I got this very curious letter from the general counsel at the university, do you want to see it? And he said, absolutely. I uh, scanned it and, and emailed it to him. And within about six hours of me receiving the letter, uh, there was a story on the Chicago Tribune about the letter uh, because it was a clear First Amendment infringement. From there, we, we had some conversation about, okay, so now we got a, a newspaper article. What do we do? Amid the controversy, Beverly says CSU quickly enacted a new cyberbullying policy for what seemed like the express purpose of penalizing the CSU faculty voice. My colleague, Dr. Bionis, um, was at a meeting and made some comment to uh, our now former um, public affairs director. And I, I think it was something to the effect of shut your trap or shut your yap. And then Dr. Bionis was notified that he was being investigated under the uh, auspices of the cyberbullying policy, which was very confusing because it didn't involve electronic devices. Professor Beverly had also been suspended for two days without pay because he had his political science seminar attend a faculty senate session on censorship at the university. They were not going to, to stop trying to infringe on our rights. We really felt that we had no choice but to move forward with a, with a suit to get them to accept the fact that we have the right to, to our expression. The Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, or FIRE, helped Beverly file a free speech lawsuit as part of its Stand Up for Speech campaign, which aims to protect students' and professors' rights through litigation. 
Civil Liberties attorney Bob Corn Revere from the firm of Davis Wright Tremaine is overseeing the case. Because of the principle of the thing, I can't walk into a classroom where I'm going to talk about First Amendment with non-political science majors. This may be the only conversation that they'll ever have in an academic environment about the First Amendment and know that I yielded when I was in the right. In July 2015, a standstill agreement was worked out with the university that allowed Beverly to continue publishing the CSU faculty voice. The case is pending a ruling in federal court. CSU agreed to settle Glenn Meek's whistleblower lawsuit for $1.3 million. In a separate case, James Crowley, the university's former attorney, was paid $4.3 million in his whistleblower case both of whom were fired after reporting alleged misconduct by the school's former president, Wayne Watson, who has not held a position at Chicago State University since June of 2016. Professor Beverly isn't the only one standing up for free speech against powerful administrators. Since 2008, UCLA has been accused of chilling speech and violating academic freedom on numerous occasions. Take James Enstrom, for example. He was an accomplished UCLA environmental science researcher and professor with over 30 years experience, until he exposed a specialist with false credentials at the state agency set up to regulate air pollution. The California Air Resources Board, which funds environmental studies conducted by universities in California. Enstrom got suspicious after reading a board study that he says wasn't up to the standards he was used to seeing from colleagues. ENT Tran is a air pollution specialist for the California Air Resources Board who in 2008 was the lead author on a report on the relationship between fine particulate air pollution and premature deaths in California. Because I disagreed with the findings in that report and felt the report was written in a way that um, did not reflect um, a person with a PhD degree, I subsequently checked and found out that Mr. Tran did not have a PhD degree. Tran's PhD was in fact a fake, purchased for $1,000 from an online diploma mill. Enstrom also criticized the Air Resources Board for not reappointing positions of its members every three years, as is required by law. Specifically, former advisory panel chairman John Freunds of UCLA, a position he held for 26 years without reappointment. Enstrom publicized the issue and Freunds was removed. This didn't win him many friends at UCLA, as the California Air Resources Board is typically comprised of administrators and faculty from the University of California system. So how did UCLA thank Enstrom for exposing fraud and contributing research in an area of his expertise? UCLA fired him. It uh, actually led to what I consider to be retaliation. I made an immediate effort to try to work with my department chair to uh, straighten out the problems, which initially he had identified only as being financial. UCLA claimed that they had run out of funding for Dr. Enstrom's position, but Enstrom was suspicious. The Air Resources Board member he criticized, Dr. Freunds, was also a member of the UCLA panel that voted not to rehire him. UCLA later claimed that he was fired because his research was not aligned with the academic mission of the department. A troubling statement from administrators given that they were overseeing a field where facts should trump preconceived missions. UCLA's shifting justifications for firing Enstrom were rejected in a letter sent to the chancellor by the university's Academic Freedom Committee. The Academic Freedom Committee of the university was basically stymied. They sent a letter unanimously expressing concern and the chancellor never responded to their letter. It's just as if the Academic Freedom Committee did not exist. Enstrom came to FIRE for help. FIRE wrote UCLA Chancellor Gene D. Block in August 2010, pointing out that it is unconstitutional to refuse to rehire a faculty member because of his protected expression. FIRE assisted Enstrom with internal grievances at UCLA. The American Center for Law and Justice represented him in a suit that was settled out of court in 2015. 
The terms of the settlement allowed Enstrom to retain the title of retired researcher along with access to UCLA resources. He continues to contribute to the field of environmental health sciences. But Enstrom wasn't the only recent whistleblower controversy at UCLA. In 2009, Dr. Robert Pedowitz, who'd been newly appointed to chair the school's orthopedic surgery department, unraveled a cover-up with life or death consequences. When I went to UCLA as the chair, I took that job. I was very excited about the opportunity that I uh, perceived to be a chair at a world-renowned institution. I knew that the job was going to be a significant challenge when I took it. Just before I was about to start officially on the ground, there was a story that came out in the Wall Street Journal uh, about one of the spine surgeons at UCLA, Jeff Wong, who had been under investigation by Senator Grassley, amongst other surgeons in the UC system and elsewhere. And the investigation related to receipt of money from industry and potential conflict of interest that could interfere with research and patient care. Pedowitz was shocked by this news. Not a single person at the university had mentioned the Senate investigation when they were recruiting him. I appreciated that um, the department I felt was under a microscope. I was highly sensitized to any issues related to financial conflicts of interest. A few months after I started there, as part of the disclosure process that's annually required of faculty, I learned that one of the other spine surgeons, Nick Shammy, had received $250,000 from Medtronic. And he reported that that money was for about 20 or 21 days worth of work, which I thought was an incredibly large sum of money for that amount of time. But what was particularly concerning to me was that the source of the money, Medtronic, was the same company that had been implicated with Dr. Wong's investigation. And it was the same company that Dr. Shami was working for as a principal investigator for a research project. UCLA had a very important role in discovery of this molecule. And that was what was being researched at UCLA by Dr. Wong. Infuse, or what we call BMP2, is uh, predominantly sold to facilitate bone growth for spine fusion. And it's a multi-billion dollar product for Medtronic. Both UCLA and its staff stood to benefit financially from the medical product its faculty was researching, violating ethics traditionally used to weed out faulty scientific data in clinical trials. In 2011, medical journal Spine published an article citing significant concerns about the research done at UCLA that led to the FDA's approval of BMP2. So as the chair, I did what was required. I reported that concern to the dean's office. As you can imagine, when I went to the faculty and, and explained that we needed to enforce the rules and clean up our act, the response was very adversarial and um, cold. And the reason for that was that the prior chair, with the knowledge of the dean's office, as we learned later, was actually allowing and in some ways tacitly encouraging this kind of widespread behavior. The rules of the university are that if one is concerned about possible whistleblower retaliation, the faculty member has to file a complaint, which then gets investigated by the university. Pedowitz felt isolated from his co-workers during the investigation, which he claims was retaliation for speaking out, and the investigator charged with getting to the bottom of conflicts of interest at UCLA had a conflict of her own. The university conducting an investigation and then making a determination for itself, I think is inherently flawed. But I had to wait for that to complete. The external investigator, in my case, had worked at UC Davis in their legal department for almost 10 years, and almost all of her professional income, I think, was derived from the University of California. So a clear conflict of interest for that investigator. I was faced with a tough decision, which was either to try to walk away or to file a lawsuit. 
he chose to stand his ground and file a whistleblower lawsuit. Earlier in the process, they had offered terms that I thought were unacceptable, including uh, basically a moratorium on my ability to do this, to communicate with press or with my colleagues or even with family and friends. They expected that I would accept those terms. And I felt that I couldn't do that. That was hypocritical because the fundamental of the case was about disclosure and transparency. On the eve of closing arguments of the trial after nine weeks, the university offered a settlement that I accepted. As far as I know, it was the largest employment-related settlement in the history of the University of California. It was $10 million, just a, a percentage of the overall cost that the university had to expend what could have been avoided in the first place had the university done the right thing. UCLA had to pay for the retaliation Pedowitz faced for raising uncomfortable issues. However, his former employer is far from the only academic institution punishing those that don't toe the party line. The principles of academic freedom are threatened at schools from coast to coast, with faculty often left fighting to keep their jobs. In order to have healthy academic environments, there, there must be the ability to have genuine disagreement. And I think FIRE is doing its best to try to protect those principles and to defend individuals that are being trampled by universities for their efforts to do the right thing. It's gonna require uh, vigilance and continued efforts by um, many people uh, across the country and uh, especially the kind of efforts that FIRE is making. The thing that I am so grateful for is that there was an organization that I knew nothing about, FIRE, and they reached out to us to let us know, we got you, they, they can't do this to you. And I think faculty members are at other universities may find themselves in a situation where they think, I have to fight this battle alone. And they don't, there, there is support out there. If you're a member of faculty at an American university and you believe your free speech rights have been abridged, go to thefire.org and submit your case. We may be able to help.